I just wanted to make a quick announcement, guys. First of all, some good news. We're going to have some changes coming to the show and it's going to basically result in more content. So I hope everyone's excited for more episodes. The bad news, however, is that SoundCloud is likely closing down in four weeks or so. Most people do listen to our show through SoundCloud. However, I've begun the process of uploading all of the content onto YouTube. So if you could all remember to go over and subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can stay up to date. I'll put a link in the description and you won't risk missing out on any of the new content. Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. This episode, as always, was brought to you by 420 Australia, your premier clothing and apparel store, as well as Organic Gardening Solutions, your one-stop shop for organic gardening. This episode, we're thankful to have Mr. Bob Hemphill on the show to talk about coastal seeds, strain preservation, and more. Hope you enjoy. Let's get into it. Alrighty, so a big welcome and thank you to a true veteran of the breeding scene, Bob Hemphill of Coastal Seeds. It's good to be here. The question I like to start off every interview with is, what was your first experience with cannabis? It was summer um, between 9th and 10th grade, and a friend of mine from the neighborhood, uh, Ron, uh, scored uh, some Mexican weed, and he had this little homemade pipe, and we smoked uh, one day after uh, school at a party, and um, then we smoked like you know two or three days later. And after that second time we smoked, uh, I knew you know I had a big love for cannabis because the way it just relaxed me. Um, where I grew up in Northern Virginia was high stress area, you know, very competitive, and um, you know just to be able to relax and connect back to nature type of vibe is you know, how I always wanted to live. And, uh, you know, it was just, just, it was awesome. And so what were the strains kind of floating around back then? Well, I could only get Mexican and Jamaican and, you know, occasionally Asian or African brickweeds. Um, and, you know, they were smashed and mostly sativa and that's where we got our first, you know, seeds to, to, to grow. We just, you know, pulled them out of some of the first sacks we, we ever smoked, and um, we just planted the seeds. And I had, you know, two really hard, hard knocks years of, you know, like the first year I just uh, left the plants in too much shade because I knew I had to hide them. And I put them in so much shade, they ended up just falling over and dying. The second year I grew... Um, had a plant growing and I had it flowering and um, I literally brought it inside because of a frost warning and stuck it under 24 hours of light because I didn't know it was a 12 and 12 light cycle that made it flower at the time and you know really hard knocks you know and so during that time were there any things around like you know like the counter bible or was this predating that and i mean i guess it goes without saying you didn't have kind of any family members you could refer to because that's something i found is a bit of a commonality between a lot of people we talk to a lot of people seem to have at least one family member who's kind of pushing them along but you sound like you didn't no i had a lot of older brothers and sisters but none of them grew or really hooked me up with cannabis um it was actually the other way around, even from a young age, I was always giving my older brothers and sisters cannabis because after that second time of smoking it, I knew um, I wanted it around me all the time. And, you know, I you know, was hustling it and trying to grow it from the start, you know, just so I could get a free sack. And like I said, the first two years I tried to grow it, it was hard knocks. But that third year, I left it out and it was Mexican sativa and I harvested it. And um, it was amazing, you know. It was total citrus, amazing high. And then um, at that time, you know, Grateful Dead would come around. Um, that, that that was when I was uh, a senior in high school, and that's when I started going to the Grateful Dead shows. And actually, people were burning kind bud out from California. And that's most of the first kind bud I got was, you know, going to a Grateful Dead show. And then the first time I actually got my hands on some kind bud seeds was uh, 1995 um, right after I harvested that uh, 
first Mexican weed that fall at, at um, a fish over New Year's show. I, I scored some kind bud from Humboldt, and I got dank seeds in that, and I, you know, kind bud seeds, and um, I grew them, and shit was amazing, you know. And I, you know, I bred those. Unfortunately, crossbred them to a Southern Virginia strain um, instead of uh, breeding them brother to sister and keeping that line pure because that was really quality weed. And so, was that outdoors? And if if it was outdoors, did that just signal in your mind that genetics was the key to you, or what? What did what did it signal to you at that point? Like you know, you had kind of this awakening with cannabis of what was possible. What was the first thing you were thinking? Like fuck, I need to start be doing this indoors with good genetics, or like you know, like maybe something different. But what were you thinking? Well, you know, I was always getting the High Times magazines and hearing about Scentsy Seeds and and Neville and all that shit and, um, you know, the amazing strains they had and, you know, I, you know, I knew good be- bud was out there. It's just, you know, being in Northern Virginia was far and few between, especially for young kids. You know, when you're in high school, you're low on the totem pole. So we just pretty much had to make the good bud, you know, and... You know, the first time I, I, I smoked uh, some good Northern Lights was uh, uh, Philadelphia Spectrum at the Grateful Dead show. And um, it was in the fall of 94, right before they came and played uh, the Capitol Center. And um, smoking that indoor good Northern Lights it was actually from this dude that, that I knew from Virginia. But seeing him at, at a Grateful Dead show, he kind of opened up more. And uh, it was just amazing. And, you know, at that same time, um, you know, we, everyone was out on a quest to get the best genetics. And I had a, a friend of mine who went to Amsterdam in early 95, and he bought packs of everything he could get his hands on, like the most, uh, you know, everything he could afford. He actually got money from another friend of ours, too. And um, those guys, uh, you know, they bought the, the four-way pack. And, you know, when we popped that, that four-way, uh, it was, you know, it took stuff over and uh me being with those guys um they had mentors unlike me they, who had taught them how to grow inside and and run shit you know like not just in a closet like run a whole basement or a whole whole grow and um i was lucky to get with those guys and you know the four-way pretty much changed it you know i was like uh we we had that and it was like uh there wasn't much better at the time the only things i remember better was NL hash plant cross and that shit was amazing and then uh NL hash plant NL G13 cross and that 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 cross used to come around to um northern virginia and it was called the kill and that was the best weed i've ever smoked to this day i remember telling the guys hey we'll trade this four-way clone for that kill clone and they straight laughed in my face you know Uh, they just didn't think it was even a, a fair trade at all where the four-way was a lot of people considered the best weed they ever smoked in their life this kill was that much better and to this day the only thing that i can you know it reminds me of is like you know chem dog and um it was very loud and just very crystally and amazing weed and so in regards to the four-way do you think that that pack was a lucky pack or like this was just at a time where Sensi was so good that every pack potentially had a clone that good in it? Well, Sensi was really good um, in the early 90s because I remember anyone that got a pack, um, if they, you know, found some good shit. Maybe they didn't keep the clones because it was hard at that time to keep clones, but everyone that was getting stuff, stuff was pretty good. But I really think that four-way was, uh, you know, very special because other crews in Northern Virginia um, told me they, they bought several packs and never found anything near as close. This thing was very skunky and uh, pretty stony and um, very just loud flavor. And so the four-way has got some interesting genetics in it, you know, specifically the Paki and the Indian, you know, we see Paki a little more common than Indian, but, you know, you rarely see Indian at all. You just mentioned it's skunky, you know, do those other genetics really influence it too much? Like, do you think that, 
And you, so you mentioned it's very skunky. Do you notice any Indian influence or do you think maybe that's what makes it more skunky than the others, so to speak, like some weird interplay between the two? You know, it's a really complex strain. Some people, you know, describe it as like a buttery smell when you're breaking it up and then like a starburst smell and um, just kind of sweet. But uh, from like 10 feet away, if you have the bag in your pocket, it just reeks like skunk. You know, like if you brought it into a two-story house, the people in the second-story house would say, uh, damn this shit, what the fuck, who, who killed a skunk? type of shit i remember one time i had long dreadlocks and I, I was you know waiting in line in a gas station and the guy kept asking everyone in line who hit the skunk and i literally had to bite my lip just to not laugh and um i finally you know got to the cash register and he's damn he's like someone really hit a skunk out there and i i can't believe the guy never thought that this dreadhead has a fucking sack of weed in his fucking pocket but he really thought someone had hit a skunk <laughs> Nice, nice. And so, just in terms of the whole timeline of things, did the roadkill skunk exist at this time or was this before or after it had come onto the scene? Well, I remember seeing skunk number one a few times in, you know, 94, 95, 96. And it was always a more citrus tone, never a loud skunk, you know, and... You know, only skunk number one clones I know of people that saved is, you know, the Las Vegas lemon skunk and then the uh, UK cheese. And neither of them smell like skunk either. I'm not saying there wasn't skunk phenos in skunk number one. I'm just saying I personally never saw them. Yeah. So you have the opinion that the uh, roadkill skunk was possibly an Afghani, which is what we've heard frequently on the show. You know, um, every time I smelled something skunky, it was... Yeah, uh, a strong indica cross for sure. And so, one of the other cuts you hang on to and I see regularly on your feed is the Black Domino. Is this one that is kind of equally as good as the four-way or do you think maybe it's almost as good but not quite as good? But, you know, like if, if anything's within the, the ballpark of the four-way, then, you know, it's like it's probably going to be elite nonetheless. Um. You know, to be honest with you about the four-way, the only reason I'm keeping it alive is uh, because of a special connection with it and what I hope it can produce in its offspring. And that's what I'm seeing. And over the years, it's always been a good producer for me. But um, the black domino cuts I have are old Sensi stock, and they're much stronger than the four-way potency-wise. And, you know, I, I prefer them. And... Um, you know, I'm always looking for any block dominant cut I can get. I have uh, one that's 1995 um, Sensi Seed Selection um, I got from uh, the Nature Farmer. And I got another one up in Southern Humboldt at a, um, a harvest, uh, Healing Harvest Farmer's Market held by the guys that hold Emerald Cup. And um, it was actually their, their vending booth. And I walked by with a friend and we'd seen uh, they had black domina for sale. And... Um, you know, I'm like, oh, I want a black diamond. And he's like, well, you know, get to the end of the line. And I, I turn around and the line's like, you know, 50 feet long. And, I, you know, go wait and end of the line. And, you know, it's fun. You know, we're talking about weed the whole time. Um, and he'll get to the end of the line. And he tells me they're sold out. And, you know, I'm like a little, you know, heartbroken. And my friend, he's a, you know, a real smooth talker. He's like, you know, you, can you, can you go look? And, the guy goes and looks and he's like, oh my God, there's one last one. And, you know, we just start giving each other high fives and shit. Because um, I was told, uh, the only thing I was told about it before I got in line is it's old Sensi seed stock. And, you know, if it's kept around in Humboldt County and it's old Sensi seed stock, it's, you know, it's a winner. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, both of them have a very narcotic uh, stone, which I prefer in a bud because I like something that will relax me and calm me down. And um, it's a mix of uh, Pacific Northwest hash plant, Northern Light, Ortega, and Afghani Number no. 1, which is uh, originally known as M10, uh, the land race Afghani um, from the Super Sativa Seed Club. So what males do you think partner well with it? Like, you mentioned it's really narcotic. So do you think that, for example, crossing it to a sativa would kind of take away from that? You want to keep it kind of in that indica-dominant realm or not necessarily? 
Well, I, I, I don't have any, but I've always heard that Scentsy Seeds produce some fire, um, really good blackjack, black dominant jack hair crosses. And then um, I personally, um, you know, got my hands on um, them, and I really was excited to cross them to the Northern Lights number one mail just to keep that old school nar- narcotic uh, indica um, Janak alive in the gene pool because it's you know that's my most sought after stuff and it seems like no one's really offering that and um, luckily KG1 had the the um, open pollination NL1 pure line that had never left the west coast that he had gotten from his friend Classic Seeds and um, I was able to select a male out of that first I popped like 40 and then I realized how good they were and I popped uh 95 and selected the best male out of all those i really went for the uh um side of the gene pool on the nl1 that was like a spray paint you know kind of a chemical and that was uh only a, i only saw it in about 20 percent of the gene pool the other 80 percent was your more classic fruity indica um you know berry kind of smell and you know, I had some good friends up, and we smoked all my chem dogs and all my OGs, and actually said uh, they preferred the uh, turpentine spray paint and alfinos to over everything. And I, you know, that's the type of male I, I was going after. You know, tried to match the phenotype. Okay, and so do you notice any of those NL characteristics in the chem dog when you were smoking that, or is it more of it was just like a preference over? Well, you know, um, as far as ChemDog, I always thought ChemDog went back to Northern Lights. Um, but, you know, recently now that I've really got my hands on some really good classic hash plant cuts, I think it's maybe a combination of the two. Um, but that's just my guess, you know, just from how I saw we progress, you know, all the best shit was Northern Lights crosses and and then, you know, ChemDog and OG came on the scene and no one knew what they were. So, you know, I, I there's some there's some Afghani genetics that were similar to that or the same exact genetics. Okay. And so, just out of curiosity, when you mentioned that Kegu had done the open pollination with the NL1, had he made any comment about how the plants that you grew out like you know was there any little slight differences between that generation and the previous or do you think that they were pretty much identical you know like i guess i'm wondering even through open pollination techniques do you think you do get a little bit of change over time or not really so from what i've learned from him um if you use as many males as many females um don't bottleneck the genetics that you can keep everything in seed form that's how he's always done his stuff his whole life. He never really kept clones until, you know, about 10 years ago. They always just put stuff in the seed so that they could grow it again. And, um, I, you know, I wish I had known that in the early 90s. I'd have a bunch of amazing lines now. So in terms of the end product of the Northern Lights you grew out, have you seen yourself or been given any NL stock or buds from, you know, any modern breeders that resembled that or was it just totally different well um to be honest with you i feel like most of the northern lights uh genetics disappeared um i was given some of sensi stock recently to grow when i was growing those ones from kg1 um I, and i got some Bodhi seeds and i and grew them at the same time and i was very thankful to find that KGU's NL1 was exactly what I remembered from a kid, and it was so much better than Sensi Seeds. It was ridiculous. And what I grew from Bodhi was the NL5, British Columbia Sea Club, open pollination, and a few other different crosses that my friend Kelly Deppfest gave me. And um, they were really good, but none of them had that narcotic um, turpentine um spray paint phenos that I was really looking for that uh, I was very excited to find in the NL1 um, because, you know, we were hoping to use it and um, that was exactly what I was looking for. So, how do you think Northern Lights 5 became this massive poster child for the cannabis community if it sounds like Northern Lights 1 was way better? 
Um, when I grew the Northern Lights one um, versus the um, British Columbia Seed Club um, from Bodie, the, his NL5 had a way better bag appeal. Uh, we're talking way better. It had a more round nug. It actually had a, more crystals on the outside of the nug. But the effect of the NL1 is exactly what I was looking for. So, with that being said about the better bag appeal on the NL5, do you think that that kind of highlights the issue of, you know, the compromise of quality traits within the plant versus bag appeal over the years? Yes. Um, when I moved to Northern California in 97, there was so much diversity in the weed grown in Humboldt, Mendo, and Trinity counties. It was amazing. And then um, right about 2000, everyone had to have purple or it became a problem to sell your weed. And then a few years after that, it was, um, you had to have OG. And um, if you didn't have OG, uh, the buyers didn't even want to look at it. And at that point, you know, um, a lot of people just dropped their old lines. And um, everyone was growing OG or purple. And um, they're amazing types of weed, but a lot of genetics were lost. And it's a shame. And so, do you think that people drop stuff out of their head stash rotation, so to speak? I guess, because what I'm trying to say is, I thought that there was always strains where people always viewed them as like, this isn't something I can sell, like grow for sale to the masses because like maybe it's hard to grow or it doesn't yield well or blah, blah, blah. But do you think strains that even fit into that category were dropped? Because I guess my initial instinct is thinking like, surely some people kept like the really good ones, even if they just figured like, oh, I'll just grow it for personal. To be honest with you, most people um, don't keep that good of a mother room or don't keep strains for long. That's uh, the reason I... You know, got the nickname the librarian. Um, it's mostly because I just keep the strains for all my homies, and I've been doing this forever. Because just like when I was a kid, I just wanted to have good weed around me, and once I have it around me, I just want to keep it there, and I just take care of these plants and very dedicated to it. And um, you know, there are other people. That's how I find these jewels and trading. You know, when I got on Instagram, it really helped uh, me gain access to a lot of genetics. Um, you know, meeting other people that kept strains like that, you know, but uh, I kept a, a lot of strains for my friends. And a lot of times, even when they were just running one strain, they'd come back and get the copy from me after a year or two, just because I kept a healthier copy, um, mainly because I never uh, compromised them, never, uh, you know, there was times where me and Hannibal literally had a bedroom in our master bedroom, not even in the closet, just in the corner. Just because uh, that's, you know, the kind of commitment I have. And uh, thank God she has it just as hard as me. And she's actually encouraged me to keep some of the strains around forever that we necessarily don't like to smoke. Um, like the train wreck is a perfect example of that. Um, when I first, you know, got the strain in the, um, 99, you know, it was amazing. But uh, that terpene will get to you after a while. I kind of joke about it being train wreck poison and so on the idea of you know the whole librarian thing what are some of the more lesser known cuts you keep in your stash that you think would be well received by the public if they were more well known the black domino it you know the public is you know different than me i'm a real ser serious indica lover you know um and anything that p the public really likes i generally try to have access to but uh, i feel like a lot of the strong uh calming indicas most people have kind of lost so uh, stuff like the black domina the northern lights number one um a lot of people don't have the real chem dog d which is absolute hands down favorite and, you know there's not many people out there you know producing those uh, you know then it caught so you know luckily people that's out there with incredibles and they got the real deal that's going to be a uh, Amazing for the weed out in Colorado. Yeah, so this idea of the fake chem dog D, I've heard of this before. I, do you think that there's just like a, a bunch of S1s floating around or are you more so referring to the D cis? Well, there's a lot of people with the sister that think it's the D and then there's tons of fakes. Um, 
out in California, if you just go to any club and you you, go, you 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 can get any elite, they're all on the menus at these clubs out here. But 99 out of 100 times, they're going to be fake as um, can be. And, you know, th- there's a million clubs out here selling chem dog. And there's a million fake breeders out there breeding with chem dog. And um, people never seen it because, like I said, it's kind of limited and, there's only a few people that really uh, grow them commercial, you know, and um, I mostly grow them for head, you know, I just cover them myself. Yeah, okay. And so, if we just jump back to that idea of you maintaining the clones and your friends would come back and grab them from you because, you know, they couldn't keep it as good as you, that got me thinking, How? what's the shortest amount of time you've ever seen for a clone to go bad? Like, have you seen a clone turned crap in say like a year because or does it take like longer than that even if it's really poorly maintained well you know i've selected phenols out of you know seed hunting and um phenol hunting and I, some of those are amazing from seed or the first clone and they deteriorate fast um you know and i couldn't tell you why and then some of these uh older you know uh really good clones i have you know they're very old and they haven't you know, degenerated as much as other clones that are younger. Because, like, I'd say, for example, 4-Way um, from 95 has degenerated more than the ChemDog 91. And um, I have the Romulan, 1969 Romulan gel cut, and, you know, that thing hasn't degenerated too much at all. It's a, you know, it'll, it's a picky little girl to go in the pre-flower, but considering she's uh, going on 50 years here in a year or two, um, She's fucking amazing, you know? And then, you know, the train wreck is deteriorating on me pretty hard in these last few years, no matter how healthy I keep it. And um, I think it's just genetic, just like people, you know? It's, you know, people age faster than other people, and it's just a roll of the dice. Okay. And so, just while we're on the topic, do you think that, Romulan Joe's cutting of Romulan is the oldest cut in existence, or do you think maybe someone's hanging on to something older? The oldest thing I know of, I'm not saying that it is the oldest by any means, um, but I've heard uh, rumors that it might be even older than 69 because uh, Pagan, the old forums guy, was uh, working on the farm and uh romulan joe pretty much dropped it off with his boss kind of deal in 1969 and he held it on to it all that time and um he's since passed away and so what do you think is the backstory behind it because what i'd heard was that um either joe or someone he knew was in the korean war and they brought back some land race and it was just like you know selectively bred to be squat and more indica though it was a sativa um, that could be total bullshit, but I'd love to hear what you think. You know, it's a squat little indica plant. You know, I, you know, it, it'll dent your head, man. You know, it's a fucking, it'll fuck you up. That's some strong shit. Um, and you know, like the brothers Grimm produced some really excellent stuff with it. You know, um, Space Queen. So. Yeah, oh, yeah, the Killer Queen. Yep, I'm gonna grow that out soon. Yeah, I think the Killer Queen is uh, um, the. Airborne G13. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true, true. Sorry. What I was thinking was um, it was it was Vic High who made Space Queen. Yeah, 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 for sure. I, I love the uh, um, um, the Killer Queen cut I have. It's amazing. And I'm stoked I just acquired the uh, Airborne G13. Oh, so. yeah. How would you describe that? That's actually probably one of the few things I wasn't able to smoke out of Tommy's collection. I just don't think he had any around. Um, yeah, how would you describe it? Because he said to me he reckons it's G13 NL2 or something. You know, that's what the old uh, forum people say. And, you know, I'm going to believe them. And I've not got a chance to flower it out yet. Oh, bum. I'm excited, very excited. I will have it um, ready, you know, in a few months here. So. Okay. And so I just got the cut all healthy and cleaned up and... You know, it takes a few months because I don't like to flower things right away because I'll get a, a bad impression generally. Oh, really? It's like you want to kind of do a little bit of revitalizing yourself before you get it in there? Yeah, because I have so many uh, clones and stuff. I don't have that many times to just run them all new ones unless, you know, I just want to have them really healthy so I don't get a bad impression and give the, 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 
dealt the clone its fair chance, you know? Yeah, okay. And so, let's get to that revitalizing of clones because this is something you're very known for. And I think the other kind of guy in the scene who's well known for this is Kevin Jodry. And he often talks about putting the plant out in the sun to veg, you know, like not letting it flower because obviously you don't have a clone anymore. Um, what do you think about this and how important is it to have that sun's role in revitalizing the clone? It's huge. It's definitely huge. But um, the most important thing is to have a good mother room. I'm talking like the everything most people out here just put into a you know, a, a flower room. You know, most people kind of keep their mom shitty, and that's what I think deteriorates them. You want a good amount of light on them. You want good ventilation. You want good humidity levels. You need a, a lot of bright light to keep those old clones um, vegging. You don't want them under some weak light. You want some serious light over top of them. And, you know, some you're going to notice they like to be off the side a little bit more, but a majority of the old clones need a lot of light. and a lot of food, a lot of foliar feeding, I think helps, uh, you know, regenerate these old clones because a lot of times they have weak root systems, you know, and it's hard for those old clones to root. And when they just barely root and they pop out these weak uh, root systems, they're never going to regenerate it without uh, foliar feeding. And um, I foliar feed coconut, aloe, um, calcium 25, um, a lot of um, compost tea, earthworm, stuff fresh extractions and um just alternate between the, all those things to get all the nutrients in there and um i think that's crucial is the foliar feed them and and then i think that helps them you know get the nutrient dense and then your next round of cuttings will be much healthier okay and so we often hear about um specifically aloe and kelp having a lot of really beneficial hormones in them i mean more specifically aloe has the salicylic acid which stimulates the plant's immune system which in turn has a big effect on kind of the whole rejuvenation process how long do you feel <coughs> you need to be doing this before it's going to work because i remember i was talking to skunk va about it and i was like yeah man you need to start using some aloe to help rejuvenate it and he was like awesome i'm going to start doing that but then it, the conversation was kind of like well how long do i have to use it before i'm going to start to see effects and things like that so how long do you think it would take through treating a mum really good, giving her all these kind of foliar feeds and all the, the good things, when would you expect to start to see some positive improvements on a sad-looking clone, so to speak? Every clone is different. Sometimes it'll snap right around at their first few foliar feeding. Sometimes it'll take a month or two. Um, but you got to be consistent with putting those products in. And I, I didn't mention the kelp, and the kelp is huge. And um, Dragonfly Natural uh, Medicines, Natural Mystic is huge. Uh, getting the alfalfa in there and um, just, uh, um, you know, alternating it up so that you get everything in there is, I think, really important. So, if we were to just jump back to how you were talking about keeping a mother room really healthy... That brought up this idea in my head of what should you do? Should you make your mother room a priority such that you say, all right, I'm going to have a smaller mother room or, for example, less plants in there and I'll try to cater to them better. And then it's, you know, like that trade-off. It's like, all right, well, I won't be able to keep as many clones, but I'll, I'll try to keep the ones I do keep in better health. Do you think that's kind of a philosophy you would advocate or do you think... Yes. Yep. A hundred percent. If you cram too many of them in there and, you know, you start uh, making your favorite ones, the special ones, suffer just for random clones, uh, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And to be honest with you, keeping mothers uh, like this and all these different clones is not financially benefit at all. Uh, you know, people making money are the people who are monocropping the newest, latest flavor. So, you know... You really just keep as many as you can keep healthy, and you know that's why I'm pretty ruthless on them. I'll, I'll call them if I don't like them. I don't keep everything. I just try to keep the rarer things and everything else. I want to smoke, and a, a few close friends around me um, want to smoke. But I, you know, I do have about 80 strains that are certified, and I'm all, I got a bunch of testing too. 
Okay, and so that raises a bit of a peripheral idea I've had on my mind for a while now. You mentioned the idea of the people making the money are the ones mon- monocropping. I've said this for a long time. I've, in fact, almost come up with my own little analogy saying at the end of a harvest, you've got kind of two results you can have. One, some bud, and you can like maybe sell it for some money. Or you can have new clones because you've grown out seeds and you've kind of pheno hunted them and you sacrifice that monocrop yield to kind of find your new elite clone, so to speak. With that in mind, how should people be rewarded for finding seeds? You know, a lot of people criticize people who want to charge money for clones, but at the same time, it's kind of like if I spent a whole cycle running seeds and at the end of it, I find one elite clone and in that same time period, you do a monocrop and make $30,000, is it kind of not analogous? Like is that clone I found kind of not, you know what I mean? Like I've traded a potential 30000 or, you know, like whatever the money value of the crop was to find that clone, you know what I mean? So, how do people get rewarded for that given that people don't seem to like the idea of, you know, people charging lots of money for clones? Well, you know, in my book, you know, anyone that's pheno hunting is highly respected and um, anybody that, you know, is putting in work to help progress, you know, rather than just ride coattails, you know, rewarded or not you know even if they don't find that amazing you know you know putting in work and helping progress it and save old stuff is you know should be rewarded you know um you know like you said you know some of these clones uh you know are worth a lot of money i personally never sell them no matter how much money someone comes at me with and i've turned down some ridiculous amounts but you know i'll pay money to buy them you know um, and to, I mean, to, I'll pay money to get them into my hands, you know, but at that point, I'll never sell them again. I'll just give them out to friends and uh, trade. Most it's trade. Yeah. Okay. So that co- almost kind of like suggests like we need to value these community members who are, you know, really doing that pheno hunting for us. And I, I wouldn't say, you know, like give thanks because I mean, they probably deserve a bit more than that, but yeah, maybe, do you feel that's an issue? Do you feel the people who are doing the hard yards in the industry do get the credit? You know, like I said, they do in my book. And, you know, I think we should keep it that way. You know, keep it old school and mostly only deal with people that are new school. If, you know, you, you're trying to get into this game now because it's legal in America and make a bunch of money because um, you see dollar signs and you think it's fun and exciting. I don't really want to deal with you, you know. I want to deal with the people that have been risking their lives, putting in work their whole fucking life. And so, as kind of a bit of a final question on the uh, vigor falling off over time thing in relation to plants, you mentioned that different genetics fall off at different rates. However, do you find that there's a commonality between clones losing vigor in that they tend to lose certain traits first? You know, I've commonly heard that flavor falls off but, um, sorry, flavor falls off first, you know, do do you find that's true or do you find some strains, no, like maybe the vigor falls off, but the flavor is still there or something like that? No, I agree with that, uh, that the flavor and the smell are the first things to disappear and, you know, they'll still get you high, but they don't taste as magical as they did. You know, a lot of these strains I have from the nineties. So, with that being said, do you think, you know, so the, the poster child, the Chem 91 for, you know, kind of, not, not to give it a bad name because it's still my favorite, word, but like, you know, it's deteriorated over the years. A lot of people say that. You, people say the potency is still the same though, but wouldn't logic suggest that the potency is reduced because we know that, you know, the more terpenes there are, the more synergistic that is with the high. And for me, at least, the, the more terp it is, the, the more potent it is to a certain extent. So, in that regard, has it not lost a bit of potency? Well, on my opinion, with these old clones, um, to make them, knock them out of the ballpark to get them, you know, to their old school vigor and best, it's not going to happen every round, even with a, a, a healthy clone. But I feel like, you know, sometimes I can knock those old clones out where they're better than anything new. So it's, you know, it just is not as easy and it's not, it, you can't do it every, every round. But, it, you know, sometimes they'll turn out just as good as ever. Okay. So kind of jump back a bit in time now. When did you first decide you wanted to start breeding? Um, when I first got those kind bud seeds at that fish show, New Year's Eve, it was turning from 94 to 95. And I wanted to have more kind bud seeds, you know. I was, uh, you know, I never had a lot of money and 
getting a, a bunch of packs from Amsterdam was, you know, it just, it seemed like too much. And to actually get seeds from a sack, you know, that I buy on a lot, you know, was a lot easier. And I, I just wanted to keep those around. And um, unfortunately, I, I, I didn't keep them pure. I crossed them um, to a strain from Southern Virginia and, you know, grew those the next year. And those were great. But if I would have you know, kept that lime pure. It would have been something special. It was really good, stony, purple indica, you know, nice Afghani. And so when did you make the transition to indoors? When I got m- m- mentored by a couple friends that uh, uh, are the guys that actually popped that Fairfax four-way seat. They were really good friends of mine, and they had a house that, you know, and I learned how to do it like that, you know, and you know, luckily I was taught right from the start, you know, as far as when to take it inside because my outdoor shit was ridiculous hard knocks. It, it would have sucked to do all that inside with all that risk and power bill and stuff back east. Yeah. And so just as a bit of a trivia one, what do you think was kind of the silliest thing you guys were doing back there indoors that you thought was like going to make the plant better, but maybe in retrospect, you're like, what are we thinking? Um, to be honest with you, the, those guys were taught by some, you know, people that knew their shit. The only thing, um, I was able to bring to the game with them was the use of bat guanos and, and kelp to help make the weed taste better. And that's kind of reason they brought me in is because they tasted that, um, seeds that I, I had gotten from that fish show and they tasted the crosses those two years in a row. I'd just grown that shit outside, like in Northern Virginia, like, we're talking in clover dales and you know that's the thing in the highway where they loop to loop because no one really goes into that intermediate or along the tr- railroad tracks and some some briar bushes and shit because i didn't grow up in the country it was more like inner city you could get to the the capital in 20 minutes you know washington dc yeah okay and so as time went by when was the first time the chem dog came to you in person um, it was fish tour and, um, it was in fall tour and, um, and we went to Massachusetts and I forgot the university and, um, you know, some of the kids that I'd met on tour were really excited. Like, Hey, when we get the, you know, mass, we're going to be able to get chem dog, you know, and be able to get chem dog and fucking, you know, it was, they just kept talking about it and fucking building it up and it was fucking, it lived up to it. It was fucking good ass weed. Yeah. That was, uh, 96, the fall of 96, that tour. I did that, no, uh, selling grilled cheese sandwiches and, um, I counted the money. Uh, my friend made them and the other guy buttered the bread and, um, I also sold, you know, any weed I could get the whole time, you know, just to get from show to show and, we get to the next show, we just have enough money to, to buy grilled cheese sandwiches, you know? And I'm talking, we could get the butter, we could get the cheese, and we could get the bread. And we used to turn that in to enough money in the parking lot to get tickets, sack of weed, and hotel and gas money to the next show and just enough money to buy grilled cheese again. <laughs> That's awesome. So, that whole time, were you kind of thinking to yourself, I need to get these chem dog genetics for when I want to breed with it? Oh, to be honest with you, man, um, I never even thought of that. But uh, me and Kim Dog had a good friend, um, mutual friend in between us. And that dude was a, a, a true hustler. And he was smart enough to keep our crew separate. Because of that way, he could get the Kim Dog from um, Kim Dog. And he could get the four way from us. <laughs> and he did that. And he did that successfully. And it's, uh, you know, funny because we were at a lot of shows. I actually think. Uh, Hannibal has a, a chillum from him from like 90, 96 or 97 from a fish show. I need to get a, a picture of that to him to see, verify, cause, but it looks identical like his old work. Okay, nice. And does this guy fit into the history anywhere? Or is he just kind of a personal friend, doesn't fit into any other of the story at all? Oh, he's somebody that I'd never mention his name, but um, he's a huge, uh, you know, respected guy, friend of Cam Dogs, and um, he's the guy that got the, the 91 and stuff to One Eye, um, who bred the Dog Walker OG out in Oregon. He's another uh, Virginia 
guy. He actually told me, uh, you know, the four way is what inspired him to start growing. And, you know, that's an honor. And it's cool to hear a lot of people claim that, you know, that was the best weed they've ever smoked. Uh, but boy, has she degenerated. <laughs> So scrolling through some of your earlier posts on Instagrams, we see things like the, I'm going to say this wrong, is it the Puna Butter Cookies? How do you say that? Yes. Yeah, Puna, uh, Puna Butter. Um, it's a Hawaiian uh, heirloom strain. And um, Kegu got those seeds from a, a friend of his. And um, this is before I was in Coastal Seeds. And he gave them to Bollywood Bam. Bollywood Bam made that cross. And... Um, the puna butters um, really stabilized the cookies, and there's some fire to be found in that. And um, I think we just sold out of the last packs, and that's that, you know. So hopefully someone will keep a cut. So how would you describe the influence of, like, Hawaiian land race slash heirloom strains? Because it's one of those ones where there's not a ton of information on it. You know, some people say... Oh, Uji Kush comes from the Krippi, which is a Hawaiian strain. And then on the other hand, you've got like the Molokai Frost, which is, you know, another Hawaiian strain, which doesn't seem to be overly similar to the supposed Krippi. How would you describe uh, the Hawaiian land race in general? And then what would you describe that the Puna butter kind of brings to the cookies? Um, it stabilizes it. It didn't throw many harms. Uh, you know, cookies throws a lot of harms and the Puna butter cookies... Um, in our testing, throw zero, and we sold a lot of seeds, and I'm sure there was a few in there, but we didn't really hear any complaints ever. So that's what the main thing it brought to the table. Um, KQ really respects those old strains, you know. Um, right before I became the Coastal, they lost uh, the Maui Wowie, you know, and KQ was real sore about that for a long time, the old Brotherhood strain, and he has high regard for the Hawaiian heirlooms because he actually got to smoke them in their heyday. So, you know, I was a young kid on the East Coast, so I really don't know much about that. You know, it's kind of, I'm seeing some now through luckily working with Coastal and Kegu. Nice. And so, how would you describe Coastal Seeds? Because I guess it's kind of differs <clears throat> from a few companies. There's a few people who breed under the banner of it, but it seems like the overall project is, you know, land race slash heirlooms. How how do you think of Coastal Seeds, so to speak? Well, Coastal Seeds is Hannibal uh, Kegu first. He started it. Um, he, he took um, Bollywood Bam as the first people to, to work with Kegu, and then uh, they brought me in and, and Hannibal in, and... Um, Kegu is uh, an OG, you know, he's 72 years old. He's been uh, growing since 1969. So me and Bam just look at him, uh, you know, just as a, you know, like a mentor. And, um, you know, just we're, we're lucky to be able to work with these genetics he has and to help, uh, help him do this work, you know, because when you're 72, you know, life becomes a lot, little harder than when you're in your prime. And, um He's got all these genetics, and that's actually the main reason I joined is because uh, he had all these awesome genetics, and I wanted to cross them to all these awesome old clones I had, and I wanted to help him keep these uh, strains pure. And as um, soon as I dug into the vault, you know, first things that, you know, grabbed my interest were um, the Northern Lights number one that's kind of disappeared. It was quality, you know, top of the line weed when I was a kid, and also the... Um, M10, that's the second thing. Um, he got that from a, a friend of his in Santa Cruz, JR, and that's some fucking quality shit, too. It's also known as Afghani number one, and, you know, those strains are pretty much not around anymore, not in quality form. And um, I was very excited to see that both those lines were exactly like I remembered. And, you know, it was very cool. And Coastal Seeds is... You know, KQ is uh, trying to grow the old land race, pure ones, because those are the, the things he remembers when he was a kid. And those are what he wants to smoke, you know. I'm trying to bring back the Indicas. Um, Bollywood Bam is, um, he's really into flavorful food and exotic flavors and taste. And his favorite weed's the Urkel. Um, and, you know, he's going to breed for what he likes. KQ is going to breed for what he likes. Um Annabelle's going to select for what she likes. And, you know, I want to read 
Indicus, you know, and that's kind of what I'm going to concentrate on. After I finish those two classic Amsterdam strains, I'm going to um, work with all the land race Indicus he has and also working with the Panama Red that uh, he had and the, the Keeper Fino out of uh, the, the selection after we had had it for a year and I grew it. Um, a lot of people were raving how good it was and KQ sent it to the lab and to our surprise, it was a two to one CBD dominant. And right around that same time, he was doing a, he had just done an open pollination. And when he does open pollination, he marks all the females and he keeps them separated and he uses as many males as he can. And last summer in August, my dog got cancer. And, um, I, you know, wanted to treat her with everything I could. And CBD, it was one of them. So I was inspired by that. And I went to him at KU and I said, you know, give me the, give me a hundred seeds out of the uh, CBD dominant pheno and I'm going to work it. And I, I took them and I grew them and everyone that wasn't CBD dominant, I, I killed except for one that was THCV. Um, it had a, a ridiculous amount and in, in the ratios. Um, we never sent it, the finished product to the, to the lab yet. We might still do that, but the leaf uh, sample, the people at, Steep Hill told Bollywood Bam that this is special. And they also told Bollywood Bam when he took the, the leaf samples in, because he deals with labs and stuff like that, um, that three or four of the uh, CBD females and one of the males had really, really high ratios of CBG. And those are in the open pollination too. And um, one of them was definitely a male. And really excited to be able to bring that pure land race CBD um, to the public and Kegu actually just sent um, some to Phylos. So, you know, we're pretty sure it's just going to start its own galaxy. So there'll be no debate, you know, it's its own land race CBD, you know, and i um, going to be excited to release that to the public uh, after this fall after it's tested. You know, I did an open pollination with like eight boys and um, 12 to 16 females. I, you know, about 60 out of the 100 were CBD dominant, and, and any ones that were weak, I called off, and I just open pollinated the rest. So when you first did the CBD, sorry, when Kagu first did the CBD open pollination, do you remember what type of percentage of CBD traits were there? Because a lot of people often reference uh, the, the older land race strains there was like potentially a, a reasonably high proportion of them that had CBD in there and it was kind of selectively bred out. Do you find that that was the case or do you think that that selective breeding took a much longer process than just kind of recent years, so to speak? Well, um, that was probably the case because, you know, back in the day they just said, hey, this didn't get me as high. Fucking let's kill this thing. Um, um, they selected that as their keeper cut before I was in coastal seeds. And, you know, I was able to just grow it when I joined. And um, I found out how special it was. I told Kegu, this is as good as anything I got. I brought some to the Emerald Cup um, two years ago and smoked to that people with the coastal booth. And everyone raved about it. And um, at that time, we didn't know it was CBD dominant. And most of them aren't CBD dominant in that, in that, in that line. But that, you know, that one mother that was CBD dominant, her 50, like 60% of her offspring were. And we're seeing now that I took just CBD dominant males and bred them to just CBD dominant females on the next open pollination of locking down the CBD genetics. Um, we're seeing higher ratios. And um, it, it, it's exciting, you know. It's a, it's a very good line because in, what I've seen in the land race so far is, you know, some good, bad and ugly and this stuff is good weed um it, like that we found out just because we kept that clone around to smoke and um it's going to be cool to share with everybody yeah so i think it was Bodie who said that he found it was kind of like being a little bit high and a bit on tequila having the cbd panama how would you describe the effects to people and i guess the the extrapolation of that is when you do get it sequenced and you know it's its own land race you know you got the proof do you think that it'll it'll open the doorway to a new type of high kind of like what Bodie referenced in that you know you don't get bud these days it makes you feel like you know he called it i think tequila weed you know that's not really common do you think that it could open the door to a whole new type of high in that regard 
Yeah, these old land race strains are definitely unique on high. Um, I need to get some pictures up on my Instagram account, but, you know, it's not the prettiest stuff. It's for the sativa lovers. It's long, flowering, long, skinny buds, um, very terpene rich. Some of them are similar to haze. And some are cherry and um, lemon. But um, KQ1 says it is the best strain to give him the munchies right now. And I grow a lot of weed and I give him whatever he needs for um, because he just got over cancer. And when he was younger, he he just loved sativas. Um, He loved sativas. And then when he got sick, uh, he really got to appreciate these strong indicas I I have because he said they just helped his pain, you know, like the black domina, the chem dog D OG Kushes. And um, it was cool to be able to, introduced some to the strains at that time in his life when he needed them yeah without a doubt and so do you think that the use of cbd treatment in conjunction with say chemotherapy for example is more effective than cbd on its own yes um you know what i did with the dog was chemotherapy treatment um combined with uh we did four to one CBD dominant. Um, it's a forty pound dog. She was getting um, about a hundred milligrams, and at first it was seventy five percent CBD and then twenty five percent THC. And um, we kept it like that for a long time. And um, at that same period, I was taking just pure CBD oil and rubbing it all over her belly and her armpits, and um, so. Um, she's still on the 25% CBD, 75% THC right now. And she had a hell of a tolerance. Uh, she, you know, she, uh, um, got cleared up for a cancer in um, in January and we've kept her on, you know, just for safety facts. Cause, uh, you can't even notice she's high. Um, she's got a, a very strong tolerance. You know, I know grown men that can't handle, you know, 75 milligrams of, THC, you know, and she gets 25 of a CBD and I give it to her and um, just to keep the cancer away because she had lymphoma and they said it was, uh, you know, very close to stage four and they were pretty shocked by the end of her chemotherapy first round that she had came in the heat and uh, they said that that was extremely rare. Yeah, wow. That's a, that's a good outcome. While we're on the topic of dogs... On your Instagram, you got a photo and you, it says headband underdog. I thought they were two different strains, or are they the same? So, you know, um, Weasel and Fondo and the crew out there, they had a, a, a strain that had all those same names. This is not that same strain. This is a very good OG Kush cut. And um, with the headbands, there is a lot of confusion. Like my friend Not So Dog has that headband from a mutual friend of mine, uh, All Quality Over Quan, and gave it to him years ago. And we've all known each other. Uh, I've known Quality for Quantity forever, but I, I've known Not Since Dog since uh, like 2006 and, and Willits. And he's got three headbands now. Um, one's Lumpas, one is the one from us, and one is Mandelbrot's. And, you know, DNA released a 707 and um swerve released released a a headband and you know so there's so many headbands and that's just so confusing but uh the one i have is i i feel like the best og kush cut there is so on the history of ogs we commonly hear that the tk is the original but i mean it's still not confirmed you know there's still a lot of people who dispute that what do you think the origins are well, I think it's very interesting that uh, Josh D's cut, the one also known as uh, the Ghost, because that is the guy that shared it on Overgrow with a lot of people, the Ghost OG, uh, the Josh D, the one that he took down to Southern California that got, was called Cush in Florida, that got the OG uh, name, OG Cush in Southern California. You know, I think that's the oldest one. Um, I think it's very, uh, you know, there's something behind it because that and the TK both came from Florida and they're both uh, amazing cuts and um, some of the best I have. 
And are you of the opinion that um, it's most likely heavily Afghani land race in origin or maybe a, a cross and hybridized a bit further before the public got their hands on it? You know, I think it's Afghani um, dominant. The nugs are definitely very round and dense. The, the high is very strong and, you know, kind of indica. But, um, you know, it's a good question. I think uh, time will tell. I think it eventually will come to light exactly what it is. You know, I think it probably went back to Northern Lights because before OG Kush, the best strains were Northern Lights. Okay. And so... I read online that you could harvest TK at 12 weeks. And so I asked Duke about that. And I was like, what's the go with that? I thought it was like 10 weeks. And he goes, oh, yeah, like some strains have got like two windows, so to speak, you know, like it like peaks at 10 weeks. That's a good time to take it. Then 11 weeks, you know, not so good. Then 12 weeks, you know, it gets good again. And I was thinking, I'd never really heard of that before, you know, I don't doubt it, but do you have any um, kind of, you know, personal experience with things like that? Or have you heard of an idea like that? Well, those are OGs and chem dogs are some of my favorite strains to grow. And um, I feel like the longer you can keep them healthy and they're green and still growing and, you know, not starting to die off and catabolize themselves, the better they're going to be. You know, I like to take them definitely 70 days, you know, if not uh, 77. So I, I like the long window. I've always liked the, the stronger, more narcotic high of all those strains. And uh, the longer you, you let them go, the more uh, better the buzz, in my opinion. A lot of the Northern Lights are the same way. They, you, they need to go like 10 weeks. A lot of those old clones like I have, like Black Domina and the Dumpster, um, they need to go. And what is the Dumpster? We've read a little bit about it online. I've seen it on your Instagram, but there's not a whole lot of information. You know, I've heard two backstories, and they're kind of similar. Um, came from the University of Ohio, Ohio campus. One story was a guy went into a bar, and he, he was having a celebration drink, and he's, you know, he's like, I'm going to buy a round. You know, I just almost got busted. The cops were on to me, and I took everything, and I threw it in the dumpster. He was like, I'm buying everyone around. They didn't catch me. And uh, some of the guys in the bar were like, huh, what dumpster? And then I've also heard another story where someone actually did get busted and um, the cops, it was early in the, back in the day, and they just maybe threw some of the weed in the dumpster and someone uh, pulled a clone out who saw all the, the lights and stuff. But it's rumored to be an old uh, G13 NL or a G13 Shiva um, skunk. And um, I see a lot of northern lights in it. Um, I think it's northern lights something. And what's your, you know, kind of hypothesis on the history of the real G13? You know, we I'm kind of sick of hearing that story about the university thing. Like, I just don't think it's true. Well, you know, KQ um, told me about, you know, he grew up in Santa Cruz and lived there his whole life. He told me about this girl and he just sat up north and he said her name was Hash Cake Patty. And um, back in the day, they used to... The, the smugglers, the Brotherhood, and everyone else uh, would smuggle hash and surfboards and, and whatnot, and um, they were smashed. And uh, that's why she was called Hash Cake Patty. And um, he said that she uh, had heard about the government growing G13, and she just turned some seeds she found out of some Afghani hash and called it um, G13 for marketing. You know, I don't, I'm not saying that's true, but, it, you know, it really makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, he's very old school, and everything you see from the government um, is a very sativa plant. And G13 that, that Neville bred with was a very Afghani plant, you know, similar to what um, the story Kig you said about Hash Cake Patty finding the seeds in the, in the Brotherhood's hash that they brought back in the surfboards that was smashed down. Yeah, killer. So while we're on the topic of the Brotherhood, it's kind of something I haven't mentioned a whole lot, but as time goes by, it feels like they're becoming more and more important in the whole history of things. What can you kind of tell us about the Brotherhood and what you knew about their contributions? Well, they're, they're the original uh, smugglers. Um, you know, I you know, heard rumors that some of the guys that uh, did the Endless Summer were part of that, you know, and 
you know, that's when they learn to smuggle stuff back in surfboards. And then, um, you know, later grew so big that they were buying brand new Mercedes Benz and VWs out of Germany and shipping them over to Afghanistan and having them filled with hash and, and, and weed and um, taking that to, uh, to California and then driving those cars already loaded with stuff to the college universities and supplying the weed that wasn't available. And um, they're the first guys that brought Indicas into America is what I heard. And um, before that, they were bringing Mexican sativas. And they are also brought a lot of the Mexican sativas to the Hawaiian Islands. And um, they were just, you know, the original guys. And, you know, anyone that can get any genetics, you know, that anyone saved off of any of their imports, uh, you know, that's what Kegu is looking for most because when he thinks back you know who was the who brought the best weed as you know when he smokes stuff that's who had the best you know they brought the tie in um they're just ogs you know they paid the weathermen to break timothy leary out of jail you know uh, when timothy leary was in there for pot charges and uh they had uh jimmy hendrix play uh private concerts for them in uh their property in hawaii you know? Full on. And so, do you think it's safe to say that what a lot of people consider to be the original breeders like Neville and the likes most likely got their stock from them? Oh, yeah. Or people um, that, you know, got the genetics from them and, you know, did the same thing I did, you know, just earlier in time, kept the seeds alive and, and bred them so they could have more of that the next year and not thinking of anything other than being able to have good weed the next year, you know? Interesting. And so, something you may or may not be able to comment on is, the more I research to the original skunk story, the more this question becomes more, you know, kind of pertinent in my mind is, in the original story the guests talked about, they speak of how um, the original skunk, it was actually a project which was t trying to recreate a clone that was both unstable and didn't breed true. And that was how... They ended up like trying to recreate it. I believe it was Mexican cross Colombian, but then they couldn't. They couldn't recreate it even just using raw land races again, and so they hybridized it using the um, Afghani first, and then crossed it back and, and made what we knew as skunk number one now. But what I'm interested in is what was really that clone that, like you know, I guess the the you know progenitor skunk. Um, what did it? What, like was, was that bowl stock potentially like what was that you know do you have any idea you know i really don't have any idea um that would be an interesting question to ask keg you but um i think most of the stock was brotherhood back then because they were the ones importing most of the weed and hash into america so chances are you know it was genetics that came from them I know the guys um, from Sacred Seeds uh, were out of Santa Cruz. And, um, you know, Sam, you know, I guess ratted everybody out and fled to Amsterdam with all those seeds. Yep. And so, are you of the opinion that uh, Sam Skunkman is not a good dude? I don't know him personally, but, you know, it's not a good thing to narc on your friends. And then take your the, everybody's work and go profit off of it. That's not fucking cool. Yeah, because I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of stories around. You know, like what I've basically heard is that everything people give him credit for bringing to the market, he didn't actually create. He just took it from someone else. You know, like notably uh, Skunk and Hayes. How do you feel about that? You know, I've heard the online stuff, and I've also heard what uh, KQ told me. And um, I know nothing about his breeding, but, you know, I just turning on your friends like that and fleeing with the genetics, man, that's cold-blooded. Yeah, without a doubt. That's, you know, all I know about that story. Yep. And so... A breeder who is very near and dear to my heart, Tom Hill, he releases a lot of strains which in many regards could have kind of fallen into projects by Coastal Seeds. You know, he was very much doing the open pollination land race type of thing. How do you view his strains? Do you have any personal experience with them? Oh, I have high regard for all of his strains and he was uh, also a pioneer in um, 
thermal triangle and growing giant trees, you know, like really f- monstrous plants, you know. And um, his knowledge is amazing. You know, he's somebody that I would love to meet. His packy lines are amazing. Um, I hold a deep chunk in high regard. Some people don't. I hold it in high regard. And, um, you know, he put out some amazing work, you know, and I love it all. And so, have you ever heard of um, any of the other lines that are not commonly referenced? Because he only ended up having like, I think it was like five or six lines for sale. But like you often heard about other lines he worked on, but just like they weren't released. Like one that most notably comes to mind is he did um, Deep Chunk Cross X18. And I think he called that the Boneyard or something like that. But there was these other strains that he had made or was working on that had started to gain notoriety. And like, I think there was another line he had. It was like the Blue Afghani. And, you know, like, have you ever heard or worked with any of those or not really? Well, I do not have the X18. And um, I would love to get some seed stock of that. Um, I only have the Deep Chunk line. And um, I'd also like to get the, the Pine Tar. You know, Tom Hills Hayes is also another line, you know, I'd love to to get, you know, just to help, you know, keeping my personal seed stash for open pollinations, you know, and to keep around and to share with friends and trade. Um, Not necessarily stuff that I'd work for with coastal seeds, you know, just stuff for the preservation aspect. Um, And so, have you ever had what you would consider to be a true or accurate representation of Hayes? Because it's one of those ones where, you know, like you still get packs that say Hayes, but... Everyone who had the real stuff says, like, you can't really find it anymore. Like, it's just not the same. I remember the first time I I tried Pure Haze. It was in Trinity County at the Tribal Stomp in 1997. Um, That OG guy, B. Smith from Denny Canyon, gave a talk that year. And fucking right in front of all those people, he said he had, like, thousands of plants that were, like, he's a tall guy. He reached over his head, like, eight feet tall just right in front of the, the whole uh, crowd, police and everything. I'm a real pioneer, but that same weekend, I got a smoke haze for the first time, and wow, it was fucking amazing. And I, I've seen it a few times since then, and um, it's definitely still there. Um, I know people that have original haze cuts, um, but you know, I don't know anyone that has a seed stock of you know really good old you know pure Santa Cruz haze, you know, only Amsterdam haze. And when you make that distinction, do you mean that the Amsterdam haze was worked towards that kind of less flavorful, more kind of chilled out high? I mean, that's what I commonly hear from people, or is there a difference, a, a different difference in your mind? Well, you know, unfortunately, I never got to smoke the Santa Cruz haze. Uh, Cake, you actually knew one of the girls that trimmed for the Hayes brothers, and um, he contacted her. And, you know, hoping she'd have some seed stock, you know, and unfortunately she didn't, you know, it's, you know, local Santa Cruz weed. I I, I heard one of the brothers is still alive. He's not into cannabis. He's in the other substance substances and um, he's into them heavily, unfortunately. And I guess the other brother died. So, yeah, that's unfortunate. I guess we may never know unless Sam decides to tell the truth. The Pacific Northwest hash plant is one that interests me because I have a feeling it's possibly one of those same plants which came from the brothers' uh, blocks of hash. Do you think that's a possibility? And how do you think that cut has persisted for so long? It seems like it's not widely circulated, but it also seems to pop up here and there at the same time. Boy, I really wish I knew who held it so I could give him credit. Um, I had seen that Bodie was breeding it with it, and um, Kegu and Bodie are good friends. And, you know, I told Kegu, here, here's the list. Anything he fucking wants, you know, I want that. Because when I was a kid, you know, and I told you I couldn't even really afford packs of Sensi Seeds, and to actually be able to get one of the cuts that, you know, Neville was breeding with it, you know, it's fucking dream come true. So, um, you know, I got it and it's, it's, it's the funk. It reminds me of the, the Scully, uh, the super Scully, the, 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 the puck hash plant. Um, it reminds me of the HP 13, you know, what I've heard it is pure Afghani, uh, Ilian race. Um, it's an amazing cut. 
And how similar is it to the Skelly? I mean, like in the sense that is the hash, the you know, the, the PNW hash plant the same? Is it just kind of look pretty unsuspecting and just kind of knock you down as well? Yeah, they all have the same look. Um, um, you know, none of them are very resinous, but it's the Terps and just that real good indica high. You know, um, I grew the HP 13 back in, in, in Willits with my friend, uh, quality over quantity and uh 2006 and ended up dropping that in like 2008 because i just couldn't get the powdery mildew off of it but that was an amazing strain and actually the most uh strain that i'm looking for the most right now i want that one the most it's amazing um they all have very similar uh buds and uh when you break them open that's when the nose really comes out of them you know, and when you break them open and start tearing it up, it, it's just a very intoxicating nose. And, you know, when Neville got the cut, um, he took his best indica male, which was his Northern Lights number one, and he bred it to the Pacific North hash plant and released those NL hash print um, F1 hybrids. And then he re- did a back cross, and that is the hash plant seeds. And, um, you know, it's really cool to be able to put the Northern Lights number one male um up to these clones you know yeah and so i mean with that in mind i guess theoretically because we should maybe state this for anyone who's not on board with this idea is that we or i strongly believe that skelly is um the result of a plant from neville's original the seed bank the hash plant seed stock which is what we just said was the hash plant cross to the nl1 back cross to the hash plant again so with that in mind you could theoretically back cross skelly either way wait no you couldn't because you don't have a male of the hash plant but you got a male of the northern light so you could back cross it that direction and you could also now you'd have to reverse it wouldn't you yeah yeah some people um i know actually a backyard farmer in south fork seeds got an old hash plant pack and it was really old stock and i was just like please give me a male i want to make a triple back cross off the pacific northwest and they didn't get a, a, a male, um, unfortunately. Um, KQ has a friend in Washington that in 1989 um, did F2s off Pacific Northwest hash plant seeds. And then a few years later, he did uh, another um, breeding, took him to F3. And um, he's given KQ some of those seeds. Um, extremely excited to, you know, uh, possibly work with those males if his friend would give us permission you know if not i'm gonna do it just for uh preservation's sake and so i wonder if you would ever be able to find out who popped the initial you know the the land raised hash plant seeds that you know neville ended up getting the clone of for his initial breeding i wonder who popped that found that that's a good question. Um, I was hoping you would ask Bodhi that. I'm going to have to have uh, a conversation with Bodhi about that, and he'll know um, the backstory on who's been keeping the clone alive because I know um, Archive and CSI also had it. I noticed it on all three of those breeders' lists, and then um, I knew uh, Kigu and Bodhi were good friends, so that's who I went through to access it. And... Um, yeah, okay. I'm sorry I didn't ask Bodhi. <laughs> You'll have to uh, know the answer. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get that question answered soon enough. Yeah, fantastic. I'd love to know. But what I wanted to jump back to for just a moment was um, you mentioned in a story a few minutes ago that you lost a plant because you couldn't get rid of the PM off it. I got a hypothetical for you. Let's say you had only one cutting of a strain that you really love and it's got that same issue. It's got PM, you can't get rid of it. Would you rather lose a cut than potentially have to use some kind of, you know, systemic chemical type thing or would you um, just lose it and kind of be happy with the memories? (laughs) So at that point... um Around 2005, I was one of the first people I knew that could get rid of uh, powdery mildew. It hit California pretty hard, and um, before that, no one had really dealt with it. Um, after growing in Willits, Hannah Bolt and I moved up to Trinidad in Humboldt County, and we lived right on the coast. And I took Master Kush, Trainwreck, Sour Way, Purple Way, Sour Diesel, Headband, 
Pacific Northwest dog shit and the HP 13 clone up into that house. And I was getting rid of the um, powdery mildew by getting the plants in a healthy grow environment, healthy humidity, good amount of light, healthy organic nutrients, growing the plants fast, spraying them with potassium silicate and neem oil at the time. And that's my only method of attack back then was those two products. And um, I had everything else clean for uh, several runs of clones, you know, and um, those two would just pop it out, uh, the Pacific Northwest and the the hash plant. And I just killed them. And I personally never used pesticides, strictly against it 100% organic. Nowadays, I'm not scared of anything. I'm like, bring it on. Um, Because with my uh, organic IPM regiments, I spray every other day with a, a uh, a Graco um, X9 paint sprayer really hard when I'm cleaning up clones um, and I'll spray every other day with micronized sulfur for a month and then I'll switch to potassium silicate, neem oil and essential oils and I'll spray every other day for a month of that and then I'll put them through like a week of green clean. Um, there's another product I'll use to just kill the fuck out of bugs and systemic and powdery mildew diseases. And I feel like if you get enough of those products in the plant, they're in a healthy grow environment, growing fast, that you can get rid of anything. And so here's the million dollar question. Do you have to abandon crop if you get some kind of bug infestation, you know, maybe root aphids, maybe mites? if you're in flower because that seems to be the big one I have issues discussing with people like people say to me you know like I'm kind of converting to organics and they're like well what do I do if I get an issue in flower and it's kind of like um you just kind of avoid that and they're like so there's really nothing you can do and it's like well yeah you can't really spray the IPM stuff in flower so what's your what do you say like you just prevention is the best answer so you know I've been growing since the early 90s and then I just told you how serious my IPM methods are to clean up clones and that's what I do before I I decide to flower something I put them through literally two and a half months of every other day spraying literally a micronized sulfur will kill uh, micro mites spider mites any fungal disease and then so all essential oils neem oil and potassium silicate so I feel like you get in all those products in there um, you're not going to have problems. I've been growing forever. Of course, I've had runs that got fucked up by spider mites or powdery mildew. But I grow, number one reason is for my personal head stash. And I want really good, strong, clean meds. And I'm dedicated. And that's the reason I've developed that two and a half month of cleaning up clones before I bring them into my flower room. And that also gets them really healthy so that I'm going to see their true genetic uh, potential and, um, you know, not contaminate the rest of the collection, you know, and then I'll put the whole collection through that treatment once a year just in case, you know. Yeah, for sure. So, on the issue of PM, I've heard that some people say once a clone's got it, it's got it forever, uh, you oh. know, and the idea of it being systemic kind of hints to that, but at the same time, I've never found hard evidence. Do you believe that you can get rid of it or you're just kind of beating it down to the point where it's not likely to manifest out? I believe uh, 100% um, that you can outrun it. When I mentioned uh, Hannibal and I moved to Trinidad and those... Uh, the um, Pacific Northwest dog shit and the um, HP 13 kept persisting. We, we when we called those, um, I didn't spray shit, and we had no PM for eight years. And I believe it was through getting the plants in a healthy environment, growing them fast, and then taking cuttings off the top of the plant while you were hitting the plant at the same time with uh, potassium silicate and neem oils. And um, both of those are fungicides in their own right. And, you know, it might be in the stump, but, you know, I took my stumps at that point, took the top of the cuttings, and I fucking got rid of the stumps, you know, and just kept the tops. And I believe um, 100% that you can get rid of powder, uh, pow- powdery mildew that way, especially if you use uh, micronized sulfur, which I didn't know about back then. That's even a, a tougher plan on the PM. It's nothing I'd want to use in, uh, um, for something I'd want to smoke, but we're talking about cleaning up old genetics here so that they're not lost. Okay. 
And are you also of the opinion that sulfur is one of the more overlooked elements in when people are kind of building their soil? 100%. It, it helps to, to, to bring out terps, um, I believe. Yeah, fantastic. And so, if we look at the discussion of ge- genetics, <laughs> sorry, if we look at the discussion of genetics throughout history, people often say, oh, genetics used to be really good. Do you think that what they're actually trying to maybe say is that there used to be more variety or do you think genetics in the past were better, per, like on average? I think on average, the genetics are much better today. I just think our genetic diversity has somewhat been lost, um, especially with the sativas that are very difficult to grow. You grow them for twice the amount of time and you get these small spindly buds that, you know, is not really what the market wants now. And some people, that's their cup of tea, those uh, soaring psychedelic highs. And there's not many um, commercial growers that will provide that for them, you know, and there's not very many places that... uh, people can go and buy those type of seeds, you know, unless it's, you know, haze or train wreck cross. So, how do you tackle that issue of having, you know, really long flowering strains? Let's just say, you know, an extreme example, you're flowering a 16-week strain. Uh, Sorry, no, let's just say 14. You know, no one's really flowering 16-week strains. 14-week strain, you know, not that unheard of. But, um, you know, should you be charging like, you know, close to twice as much as like a seven or eight-week strain? Like, how... How do you compensate that in the business model when, I guess, you know, a lot of people are probably not going to expect, maybe they'll ha- accept a bit of a price increase, but maybe if you look at the flower time proportionately, they, they won't budge and that, and that was the driving force that got us to this spot, wasn't it? Like, you know, how do you think we'd tackle that issue? You know, unfortunately, um, what I see is people that are complaining that there's no sativas, but then when the sativas are available, they're not willing to pay any more for them, and the sativas actually get overlooked. Pretty much, it's, uh, if you're a sativa lover, I, I recommend you, you get some good sativa genetics and grow them yourself in a greenhouse, because, um, you know, that's where sativas really shine, in my opinion. And so, if we look at the photos on your Instagram, a lot of them are from greenhouses in fact you probably struggle to kind of find one in an indoor setting do you do indoors at all or are you all outdoors no i I love indoor growing i keep uh, a lot of my mom's indoors currently i am excited actually to be moving them to my own uh, facility with uh, just me and hannibal um and salinas um going for the legal permit down there um 10,000 square feet so that we can keep the quality up but uh you know I love to work outside, you know, and if I had an opportunity to work in a greenhouse versus an indoor warehouse, I'm going to take the greenhouse any day of the week. Um, I love being outside. I love being with nature, fresh air, um, not under the artificial lights, being under the sunlight. And um, I'm really, really working hard to bring the quality of my greenhouse up to the quality of my indoor. And, you know, that's a fun challenge for me. Yeah, see, that's an interesting one in my opinion because... Often I find people, you know, they'll say outdoor is the best, it's unbeatable and it's like I think what they're really trying to say is like theoretically it can do better than indoor but rarely do I find personally outdoor that is better than indoor, at least my indoor. How do you feel about that? You know, like are you of the same opinion that like outdoor is the best or like, you know, in the sense of that mindset of like theoretically or do you literally believe that or do you believe the opposite? Man, I just like to be honest with myself. And, um, you know, my favorite strains are Indicas. And when I turn them out inside, they're fucking amazing. And I'm getting close to that quality, I feel like, in the greenhouse now. And um, I feel like greenhouse quality is definitely better than full sun. I really love smoking full sun organic wheat, though, that being said. You know, it, there's something about, um, especially if it's grown in the ground, you know, and it can get some of the native soil and the flavors um in the full season and just the whole experience is uh is is really good but you know if you're talking about growing an old clone like one of my black dominas or one of my chem dogs or one of those old ogs indoor in a stable um humidity and a stable temperature um those old client clones shine better with they just like the stable environment i don't think it has to do with the lights i think it's more about the stable humidity stable temperature Okay. And so, you know, often you'll find that 
plants will grow slightly different phenotypically, slightly different taste-wise and potency-wise when you compare them indoors to outdoors. Do you find that there are some strains that, you know, have one taste indoors and when it's outdoors, it's like it's quite a pronounced difference in flavor. Like what strain to you has the, the biggest just natural variation when you transition it from indoors to, say, greenhouse? Well, you know, um, the Chemdog D is a, a, one of the flavors that you can really hit or miss. And um, I really enjoyed the full season sun grown I did last year. It was really uh, cool. You get a lot of strains out in the sun, and they're just going to have thicker stems and really shine. Um, but the best stuff outside, if you can get it in a greenhouse, is the sativas. That's, you know, they just shine outside under the sun. They don't like being close to the lamps. They grow all tall, you know, and then getting close to that warm lamp, they, they don't seem to like it. Um, if you can get them in a greenhouse and just get them under the natural sun, they just that's one of the strains that that does turn out better outside than does inside for me are are the sativas and so what's your favorite land race sativa to be honest with you i really like this panama red stuff it's it's good i i've been smoking the the crap out of the thc vena uh thc v uh fina um we haven't got the percentage tested but i've been smoking that a lot and um to be honest with you, I haven't worked with too many land race um, sativa lines. Um, Kegu, that's his specialty. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm new to coastal seeds, and I, I went for the old Afghani lines that I knew as a kid first. And, um, you know, it's uh, I have some cool old cuts, you know, that I like a lot. One of my favorites is the um, monkey paws. It's a uh, um, Vietnamese soldier brought back a... Uh, Vietnamese black, and he crossed it with the Nepalese Highland sativa uh, up in Michigan, and that's a real old clone that um, for, for like a, a 12 to 14 week sativa really uh, has a lot of earthy um, Kush flavors in it, um, and uh, they're really kind of grounding, not so paranoid of a high for that, that sativa, and that's one of my favorites. Um, the Pacific Northwest dog shit. Um, is another one of my favorite old sativa cuts. Yeah, I mean, that's a plant we've never really spoke of on the show, but I think I read online that there's like a few fake dog shit cuts that go around. What do you think about that? Do you Have you had anything along those lines, or do you think like, no, it's just um, one of those cuts where there's a few, there's other plants that have similar characteristics, but like, you know, it's fakes essentially. Well, there's a Humboldt dog shit, which is different from the Oregon Pacific Northwest dog shit. And um, if you go to any of these clubs or dispensaries in California, they're going to have clones of everything on the menu. And 99 out of 100 times, they're going to be fake. So it's pretty much um, you want your dog shit cut to come from a certain crew in Oregon, you know, because that's where... You know, it's the real one. And that's what I'm big on my clones. It's provenance. I really try to get them through the right people so, you know, it's the right clone. Yeah, okay. And so, in general, when you're looking to do a breeding project, do you approach it in more of like a calculated method in that you kind of thinking what is going to pair really specifically well with a certain strain? Or are you more so just like, I like this one male, let's hit everything with it and then see if any of them particularly work well. Um, no, I've, uh, I've kind of been doing kind of like in-cross work where i uh, crossing these lines back into something that I think's in them, you know, um, or definitely confirmed in the strain, you know, to kind of stabilize it and bring it back to a, a pure form so that other breeders and friends can get these uh, strains and back cross them further or take them and work lines with them. I really want to um, provide old school genetics and stuff that's worthy for people to breed with. Do you foresee a time where your breeding methods would have to change by virtue of just, you know, uh, there's, ne- you, let's just say we fast forward 10 years from now and Coastal Seeds has got an awesome menu with most land race strains on it worked to a point where you're happy to have it publicly available. Do you think you would then look at, say, doing some F1 hybrids with land race strains, kind of similar to how Bodhi does, or 
what would what would you look to do at that point if you know you had to kind of if you were forced to evolve out of just doing preservation work well um i'm going to spend 50 percent of my time pretty much doing the preservation um pure lines and then i'm going to spend the other 50 percent concentrating on these nl uh, lines with the hash plant and the um m10 and uh working those Okay, and do you have an end goal foreseeable with those, or are you just kind of see where it takes you? I want to remake that uh, old kill strain from North Carolina that I used to get. That's the best weed I've ever smoked. Uh, um, the Rapture, the Kill. And sorry, you said that was a uh, G13 cross NL hash plant. NL hash plant, NL G13. Yes, old school Amsterdam stock. So how are you gonna fill that NL G13 spot? Uh, luckily, I just got that airborne G13. Uh, okay, and you think it'll? It was maybe the airborne used originally, or you like? Because I guess what I'm thinking is the airborne G13 in my eyes is not like pure G13. You know, it's like it's a cross. It's the closest I can get, and um, it's actually uh, I think it's uh, G13 by NL2, so it's actually half the work done for me. Yeah, okay. And so, do you think the real original G13 is still out there or you just think like, no, nah, we haven't heard about it for so long, it's it's most likely gone? You know, I like to think that um, anything could be out there. You know, a lot of people that put in work uh, don't come online. I just came online uh, with my Instagram account a few years ago, you know, and I had tons of strains that uh, people really didn't have and, you know, I've really shared them a lot, you know? Yeah, okay. So you never know who's going to come out and bring a blast from the past. And a lot of time when these classics come up, they want uh, cookies or Skittles or something like that for these old classic gems. And I'm happy to oblige. So what is the most terpene-rich plant you've ever had or grown yourself as a bit of a just totally different question? Wow, there's so many of them. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of time when you get super high amount of terpenes in a strain, you, you don't really get potency, and that's uh, a rare combination. You know, um, this lemon tree out of Santa Cruz, that's one of the few uh, strains that really combines the two together. It's an amazing cut. Yeah, do you, do you know the history behind the lemon tree? It seems to have gotten a popularity really quickly, I mean... I think people may have seen it, uh, Swamp Boys breed with an S1 of it as a mother. So that's even a bit of an interesting thing in itself. Yeah, um, I have the cut through Santa Cruz and it is um, literally, uh, as soon as I harvested it, it's like this top 10, top maybe top five um, in the collection. I've heard it's, you know, uh, maybe an old strain called Lemon Drop or a, 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 a Lemon Tie Cross. Um, it's a very short, compact indica growing plant with a very lemon strong flavor and a narcotic high. So very strong. And so you think this isn't a new hybrid, but just something that's been unknown for a long time. And like, do you kind of know any more of the genetics besides the potentially that it's the lemon drop? You know, that's, uh, all I know, you know, that's pretty much it. The rest would just be me taking somebody that's something else you know yeah might not be true and i don't want to lead anyone in the wrong direction but i'm pretty sure that's kind of like what the the guys are saying yeah so i mean on the other spectrum of instead of being a hyper cut like lemon tree what do you think is the most underrated cut you know the one that doesn't get enough cred for for what it is um you know i i I think Kim Dog D's hand down the best weed, and you know I don't have that many people that agree with me unless I smoke it with them. Um, the Black Dominus are really good. Um, the, the Super Scully, the Puck Hash Plant, when done proper, is uh, really really good. Red Lebanese Hash Plant I have is an amazing cut. Um, the ADH Sheet Thirteen Hash Plant. Those are all some of the most uh, kind of underrated. I guess the ADHD 13 hash plant's been getting a lot of respect uh, because Bodhi used it and, you know. Yeah, okay. So, just while we're on the topic, 
I guess you kind of already answered it. Overall, you just said you prefer the Chem D, but do you think the 91 is more potent than the D, or no, the D actually takes the potency for you as well? Potency, 100%. Um, when done right, I think uh, they're both very picky, but, you know, um, I think they're equally picky. People say the 91's pickier, but I think uh, the D is very picky too, and um, it's mine and Hannibal's favorite weed. Okay. And so, what's the one cut you most wish you could get your hands on? Um, HB13. And are you confident it, it is still around? Yeah, either through the uh, Island crew or the New York crew. Um, I could probably get it. It's just, you know, that's obviously a lot of work. Okay. And so, I found an interesting photo on your Instagram feed. You know, it, it's, I'm pretty sure it's like a, compost tea from what you said in the description but honestly it looks like soil with these crazy mycelium hyphae forming all through it kind of looks like you know kind of like the way bakashi does to your topsoil what's your recipe for an awesome tea like that because that was like the, the most photogenic looking tea i've ever seen yeah um so one of the key ingredients for me to get that mycelium uh, that's Thick, it'll literally uh, stop fungus gnats dead in their tracks. They'll it'll kill them. Um, is the grokashi, and then you know you mix that with some dragonfly earth medicine, um, brilliant black, and then uh, some really high quality compost and earthworm castings. It's really you know it really I can't emphasize uh, you know how important it is to get high quality of those two products and also to get several sources of high quality compost, several sources of high quality um, earthworm castings for the biodiversity. The keys are the the grokashi and, and the brilliant black. They just get it looking like a carpet. And so in general. How would you describe your growth style? Are you like, you know, you kind of run like a no-till type of system or more of like a super soil type of thing or liquid? How, how would you describe yourself? Um, I uh, would describe my style as um, I do a lot of top dressing. I do a lot of fresh extractions of earthworm castings and compost. I don't brew them. I'll just extract them into the water and water immediately. Lots of uh, foliar feeds as we go into the first uh, beginning of flower and through veg, you know, to really make sure it has everything it needs and the right parts of the plant and the top of the plant. Uh, and then, um, you know, I just kind of, uh, you know, sounds a little hokey pokey, but I, can, you know, just can look at the plants and, you know, I get high and I spend time around them and I can just read, read the plants, and what they're lacking and how happy they are by how they're holding their leaves and how their growth is. And um, I really feel like if you can hang out in your grow room for a certain period of time, um, look at your plants, kind of vibe off of them, leave for a little bit, go take a bunch of bong hits or, you know, smoke a joint, whatever you like to do, and then go back in and just read and vibe. You do that a couple times a day for a long period of time, you're really going to be able to just walk into a grow room and, and look at plants and be like, that's that strain. Um, that strain is unhappy because of the way it's holding its leaves. I can see, you know, the different strains by, uh, you know, their leaves and um, just how happy they are. And, you know, you really, you know, it just comes with spending time with the plants. And so what do you think is the kind of upper ceiling of what one person can tend to in terms of plant numbers and giving them adequate care because I think a lot of people are worried about the idea of big companies coming along and you know like the idea of like a grower having to tend to like 10,000 plants in a day and it's like it's like surely you're spreading yourself too thin at that point like plants can't be getting enough attention what, what for you is do you think the upper limit yeah, well, you know, I grew nine acres for a, a hemp company in Colorado, and by the time we got it back around to the other side of the field to, to water them, they were about to die of water, and, you know, that wasn't a fun experience, and since then, I've turned down a couple job offers to be, you know, head growers for large operations, and Hannibal and I decided to, um, you know, go for it and put the whole life savings and uh to go get permitted in monterey county in salinas and uh get a ten thousand square foot permit and um you know that'll be cool because 
I'll be able to have the, the collection in there safe in a greenhouse and yeah for sure and so a question I wanted to ask you because I think you might be able to give an interesting perspective on it I've done some research on the history of Northern Lights and I'm sure you're pretty well versed in it given the projects you're doing I have a feeling that the guy who first gave Neville the Northern Lights you know the Indian Joe I have a feeling that's Romulan Joe what do you think about that so um, for a long time growing up, I'd heard that they were the same person. Um, recently, when I started the project, um, we did a lot of investigation in KQ, calling up old friends, um, me doing any research, Bollywood Bam doing um, computer research. And Bollywood Bam found this ho- uh, High Times article where it said that they were the same person. KQ's research... Um, led to uh, the fact that they are definitely different people from what I believe and what he told me. Um, I think some of the original uh, Northern Lights guys are on Facebook. I, I'm not on Facebook myself. Um, from what he told me, some guy named Herbie is the guy that brought him back from Afghanistan and gave him to Seattle Greg. Seattle Greg worked with two Joes, and one of them was Indian Joe. Um, that's who KQ's friend uh Classic Seeds met up in Oregon, and that's where he got the NL number one stock. So I think uh, Seattle Greg is in the islands, and that would be one hell of an interview if you could get him to talk. Huh, interesting. And so do you think as with people like this where that old stock resides, not just necessarily for Northern Lights but for everything type thing? You know, um, if they still have some Northern Lights uh, you know, that would be very cool. Um, we're not supposed to release the Northern Lights Pure ourselves, so we're only supposed to release hybrids. And why do you think they wouldn't want to come forward and get credit for what is easily, you know, the poster child of all cannabis? I, I just think, um, from what I've heard, maybe he hasn't been approached by somebody like you. Uh, I think if he's admitted it on Facebook, why wouldn't he want to admit it on a bigger show and get further into it? Hmm, okay, we'll have to follow that up. <laughs> so, I've been digging around on Instagram for a bit and I found a post which says that you have a legendary backstory behind the Red Lebanese hash plant um, and you think it could be closely related to the G13. You know, what is that story? Well, um, from my understanding, Howard Marks, the smuggler, gave Neville his two favorite strains, um, the Red Lebanese hash plant and the G13 from America. And um, Howard Marks is also known as Mr. Nice. He's since passed away. Rest in peace. And um, he also, you know, he obviously was importing a lot of weed from all over the world to England and to Europe. And um, he uh, shared some of those uh, Red Lebanese seeds with somebody in California, and um, Bollywood Bam um, was given the cut to hold on to because they knew he held on to stuff, and he gave it to me a few years ago, and I've been holding on to it. You know, it's from the same stock, you know. I 100% believe that um, from smell, taste, grow, um, stone. Um, it's just, unfortunately, we just have the cutting. We don't have seed stock. That's really interesting to note. So, what can people expect from the Northern Light crosses you've made? Like, what type of plants would, like, if, if what type of plants should someone expect if they buy this packet? And more importantly, what would you advise each person to get? You know, so if I'm looking for a real super narcotic one, which one is the one I should go for? Well, to be honest with you, if uh, they're not up to, to par, I'm not releasing them, and. Um some of my favorites this far uh, are the Black Lights and the Pakia, the Super Scully hash plant by the uh, Northern Lights number one, and Sensi Seeds uh, selection of Black Domina by Northern Lights number one. Just because of, uh, I like to smoke the mothers a lot, and uh, you know, I just like that old school narcotic indica buzz. Yeah. Okay. And so, just last question on Northern Lights for the moment. Often I've read things online saying that the uh, SSC, in a lot of their crosses, they used a strain called the Basic 5. I've heard people say that they think that's just like what they called the Northern Lights 5. Do you think they were the same or different? 
I think that they were the same from my understanding. Uh, the basic five was the uh, NL5. Awesome. And so, when people think of Afghanis in general, they're often thinking of things like, you know, Baba Kush and Master Kush, like, you know, these real squat plants, big fat leaves, you know, really broad leaves. However, as we know, there's there's a lot of Afghanis that aren't like that, you know, they're more thin, they're more taller. How do you think it got to the point where people think of Afghanis as these, you know, squat indica plants and no one really thinks of them as, you know, these taller, thinner leaf plants, even though they were, you know, definitely there? Um, from what I heard, um, a lot of the, you know, original hippies that went over here, they make their own hash and they preferred the little bush weeds that grew in the drainage ditches that were these really fat leaved indicas that, you know, just really slow growing, hard to grow. And what the um, people are, were actually growing fields of was uh, a taller growing variety, just easier to grow. And, um, you know, easy to grow an acre of, you know, because growing an acre of bubba kush is a pain in the ass. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, Bollywood Bam um, got a, a bunch of seeds from his father. Um, unfortunately, right before his father was killed by a suicide bomber in Afghanistan. And um, it's called the, he calls it the last laugh after uh, his name his father um and uh you know that's a much taller growing um longer internode afghan um i guess uh his father had connections and he got it from the you know i guess the department of agriculture over there in afghanistan and the strain had 250 years of uh provenance behind it documented it's not what uh we were all thinking we were uh you know gonna see afghani you know um it was a taller very drought resistant, very tough plant that had CBD in the gene pool, THC in the gene pool, um, purple in the gene pool, green in the gene pool. Um, they were a denser indica nug, but they had a, a taller, uh, stretchier inner node structure and, you know, something that would be better for large scale agriculture. And um, the only time he's released any of that was for uh, the auction for Mandelbrot's son. And uh, he kind of keeps that line tight. And so, would you guys ever consider working with it or you just don't see it having that much breeding potentially because it's just so suited for just an entirely different style of growing to what we do? You know, BAM has done a, a few uh, open pollinations on it and um, that's a question you'd have to ask him. Okay. And so, how would you feel about ever doing a cross where you're really kind of mixing old and new, you know, like one of your old school lines like you know maybe the panama with something totally new you know like just to throw a random one out there in pure kush you know one of the kind of more newer hybrids <clears throat> well you know um you'll see some of those for me but mostly you'll see uh the older you know classics clones that have stood the test of time bollywood bam likes to breed with some of the newer clones so you'll see that from him you know when he did the puna butter cookies and the holy head bam those were two examples of him breeding in that style uh, mostly what you're going to see from kegu is uh um open pollination land race pure sativas so that's the cool thing when we come together um Hannibal likes something bollywood bam likes something i like something and kegu likes something and we all uh share genetics, and then uh, breed for our own uh, what we like. And so, are you kind of of the same school of thought of uh, what I think DJ Short is kind of quoted as saying is that, you know, at the end of the day, all that really matters is the end effect. And so, I guess the underlying question I'm wondering is, is um, what makes something worthwhile breeding for you? Does it just come down to effect or does it have to be a compromise of things? So, um, it's 100% effect um i want you know to breed for uh strong indicas you know i, I remember and i want to have and those are the favorites in my collection and to have them fresher and re you know rejuvenated not you know 15 to 30 year old cuts is a, a you know a really exciting thought yeah for sure and so what is the biggest fear you have about the sweeping out slash, you know, kind of unrolling of legalization in California? How do you think it's going to affect things positively and negatively? 
Well, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of people getting into it that see nothing but dollar signs and they're growing way too much weed. Um, that's why we went for the 10,000 square foot permit. It's actually the smallest permit available. And, um, you know, that way we can pay attention to our weed and Hannah Bolt and I can grow it and it'll be grown by us and not by irrigation or uh, other people that we hire to work. Um, we can actually handle it ourselves and with, you know, but, you know, I had to basically, you know, spend every single penny we'd ever saved in our life just to do it. And it's been extremely stressful. And the fact that, you know, it is going to be competitive, um, it's going to be hard, you know, uh, for certain people to be nice, like they were sharing genetics with friends and, you know, the greed, you know, just because you, everyone's putting their whole life on, on the risk. So that, that's not a good thing. Um you know, the people getting into it from other industries just for money, uh, that's not a good thing. Um, old school people being left out and taken advantage of, you know, that's the worst thing. That's why I advise anybody, uh, team up with your friends and try to get a permit. You know, go ever, wherever you can. You got to get them now um, or you're going to be shut out in California. And let's, you know, keep the power with the people that have been pioneering and working with this plant um, their whole lives. They deserve it. You know, um, one of the good things that's going to come out of it is, uh, you know, you know, me getting the mother collection and a place where, you know, I can go over 99 plants and keep them legally safe because in Santa Cruz I'm only allowed 99. And um, then uh, being able to select over 99 without fear, you know, and to be able to show stuff like that you know, to people on Instagram, you know, because a lot of times they don't get to see everything just uh, for safety's sake. Yeah, without a doubt. And so just to play devil's advocate, let's say the worst case situation happens where there is just a few large companies mass producing really bad quality weed. Do you think in that situation things would revert back to how they were before legalization where we'd go back to, you know, people just doing stuff underground, growing, you know, the better stuff and, you know, the black market blooms again? So, you know, I like to think that, uh, you know, this show will hopefully encourage people in California um, if they don't have their permits to go out and get their permits. Um, I would like to see um, the people that have been in the game stay in the game. You know, but like that, you know, if, you know, I said Hannah Bolt and I are risking our whole uh, life savings on it and we're going to work our hardest to make it work, you know, and we work hard. But, you know, if it didn't, shit, I'd be in another state um, in a house, someone else paying all the fucking bills. You know, I'm never going to stop. I won't stop. I can't stop. It's what the fuck I do. I didn't have any fear then. I'm not going to have fear, you know. But I'm putting everything I got into making it in the legal industry. And so a question that's quite specifically relevant to Australia, do you think that people should compromise for access to medicine if it's, you know, sub-quality, you know? Is it worth allowing like a pseudo-medical system through if all it is is... Um, you know, like large companies, you even like specifically people like tobacco industries are really looking at getting in the game. If it was just a few big providers like them, would you settle for that in terms of like as, as a society? Should we settle for that or should we be like, no, have to be able to grow our own or at least have, you know, some means of access to high quality medicine? Yeah, I say overgrow the government. Everyone in Australia should be growing their own medicine, legal or not. You know, if it's not legal, just don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Just, you know, do it like we did in Virginia in old school days and make the good medicine there for the people and grow it good and um, from form your crews and, you know, form your uh, networks to get the, the buds to the, the patients underground. You know, definitely don't trust the man to grow your medicine. You know, everybody should be able to grow their own medicine. And if they're too sick to grow their own medicine, they should know that someone's going to grow up for them that's not fucking spraying pesticides on it or, you know, doesn't give two shits about it. Because I feel like it's a, a type of plant that needs love and uh, it needs, you know, a caring uh, um, person to take care of it or, or the medicine ain't going to be the same. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely of the same belief. 
And so, just to kind of get into our last couple of questions, who's a breeder who you really like their work, you know, and, you know, bonus points if it's not someone who's just doing land race work? <laughs> Archive, CSI, Top Dog, Freeborn Selections, Dos Peros, Bodhi Seeds. I know I'm leaving some out because, um, you know, it's the – Actually, I feel like it's the golden age of America, American breeders right now um, with, uh, you know, the selections and the, this, the, the community, you know, being able to get so many different clones off of uh, Instagram and stuff. And so many different people are breeding and going in different directions. Um, it's going to be cool to see how shit progresses because I know Coastal Seeds is going to be trying to provide the land race building blocks and, you know, there's people out there trying to progress stuff and bring new flavors. So there's just so many different people with different goals and so many people breeding in America that it's, you know, it's it's kind of a, the golden age. And so if you were just a breeder, uh, sorry, sorry. And so if you were just a grower and you had to go out right now and you had to buy one pack of seeds, a modern hybrid, which pack would you buy? Um, chem dog from top dog, one of his pure chem dog crosses, preferably one of the, the Trez dog back crosses, because I feel like the, the Trez dog, uh, triple back cross chem D he made, um, is one of the best breedings in the marijuana community in history. Um, you know, he gave those Trez dog seeds to high and lonesome, high and lonesome bred the, uh, Dog Waltz and the Appalachia, what Bodie bred with. And then um, JJ uh, kept him and worked him himself and made the Star Dog and the original New York City Diesel. And um, there are so many Keeper Star Dog cuts. And my Dog Waltz cut is one of the most amazing and all the amazing stuff that's come from the Appalachia. So I'd say, uh, you know, just going to have to go with uh, the odds that is history stacked down and go for some inbred chem from JJ if I had to go for one pack. It sounds good. And so what are your kind of, you know, top five, top ten favorite strains for just smoking yourself? Chem Dog, um, OG, Black Domina, My Hash Plants, and then more Chem Dog D. <laughs> nice tight list. But I love everything. If I didn't love it, I, I, I wouldn't keep it. So my headband is one of my favorites. I love Sour Diesel. It, it, there's so many of them. I love all these new strains. I love Dosey Dos. I love the real good cookie cuts. I love the Sunset Sugar. You know, I just got that papaya. That's pretty impressive stuff. I'm smoking on that now. You know, the strawberry banana from Crockett. You know, that's some serious fire. Um, a lot of stuff from Bodhi. It's really good. Um, Hippie Slayer, Dread Bread. Yeah, it's pretty deep. I, you know, I could never even remember all the clones I have at once. That's why, you know, labeling and uh, a list is very important. Yeah, no worries. So, if you could have one strain back that you used to have but have lost, what one would it be? Oh, there's so many. So, one is tough. Um, I had Sag Martha's Bubbleberry from like, uh, 96 and that stuff was amazing every uh pheno in there was amazing um i never had my hands on the rapture kill but you know that would obviously be it but i never actually got it i did get some seeds and i later crossed those to nlak 47 and, and made some some really good hybrids that i would love to have those i was growing those in um in colorado in like 99 2000 and I'll um, AK by Super Silver Haze crossed into the Rapture. And I had two Finos back then. And anyone I smoked them with, you know, would admit that they were one-hit shit. And I'd have to say those. Unfortunately, I've lost all the seeds from that line. Yeah. And so who's uh, some breeders you'd love to do a collab with? Um, Bodhi, uh, CSI, Top Dog. Um, keeping it cam. <laughs> uh, those are guys that you know have been putting in work for years, and I highly, highly rec- uh, you know, uh, respect them. So, yeah, awesome. And so, 
If you could go back in time to anywhere to get one land race strain or seeds, you know, from anywhere, where would you go and what would you get? Uh, I'd probably be buying from Sensi Seeds uh, a bunch of hash plant and black diamond right when they were released. But if it, it was, uh, you know, had to go for a land race, I'd be in Afghanistan and, you know, like 1977 and the Hindu Kush Mountains uh, close to um, Pakistan. Nice. And so final question. What are your top traits you look for in a male when you're breeding? Um, he's got to be like uh, the sisters that are keepers. You know, if the sisters aren't keepers, I ain't going to fucking breed with the male. You know, um, keep them around for a long time and torture them, you know? Yeah. Just Before make sure he stands. Them. Yeah, make sure he can stand that test of time. And yeah, don't, you know, mess, put him through the ringer. Awesome. So, thanks so much for coming on the show and for spending the time talking to us. I look forward to growing out some puck you, hopefully. Thanks for having me. I'm, you know, I love talking about this plant and it was a real pleasure to be here and talk with you. You're an amazing host. Can't wait to meet up in session person. Awesome. A huge thank you again to Bob for sitting down and talking to us. Be sure to check out Coastal Seeds. Particularly, there's the upcoming release of the Northern Lights lines through Seeds Here Now. A big shout out to 420 Australia and OGS, as always, for helping to make this episode happen. La, 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 la. And a big thank you to you guys for listening. I'll see you. <laughs>